Lloyd, just so you know, every time I listen to your show and you go from a segment to a break and the, the music kicks in, mm-hmm. in my head, I picture me and you driving down the road doing Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> It's funny because I think the same thing. I think of you two as Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, 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 that's right. Faith, firearms, and freedom. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hi folks, happy Easter and welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 167. Welcome to another week of faith, firearms, and freedom, and thank you so much for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week. I'm glad to have you with us. We've got a great show today. Today is Easter, and um, this past weekend was the Arkansas State IDPA Championship in Perryville, Arkansas. Now, what does that have to do with Easter, you might ask? Well, bear with me. If you follow my other podcast, the uh, Unload and Show Clear podcast, you saw my Facebook Live videos from the match, and you saw just how miserable and awful the weather was. It was rainy. It was 52 degrees and windy. And by the end of the match, I was absolutely soaked completely through my clothes, could not feel my fingers. My my feet squished every time I walked because they were full of water. Uh, my pockets were full of water. I couldn't hold on to the gun uh, securely. It was I was fighting to keep my strong hand or my weak hand on the gun. Every time the gun recoiled, I couldn't get warm. It was just absolutely miserable is the is the really the only way to describe it. Well, this past Friday night, I took my kids with me and we went to church for Good Friday for the Tenebrae service. Now, for those of you who are unaccustomed to sort of um, traditional Christian services, Tenebrae service features a gradual extinguishing of the candles on the altar and finishing with what's called a strepitus. It's a, a loud noise. And we finish the service in total darkness and exit in the dark. This is a recreation sort of of the final moments of Christ's passion as he gave up his spirit and the earth quaked and the sky went black and the veil in the temple was split in two. Um, I was reminded in that service as we sang the hymns, as we read the Psalms and and passages from Isaiah, reflecting on the, the suffering of our Savior, that whatever misery, whatever suffering we experience in our lives, it really pales in comparison to Christ's passion. The shivering, the cold, the stiff fingers, the joint pain that many of us felt standing in the rain last weekend in Arkansas is really nothing compared to the bitter pain, the betrayal, the physical and mental anguish suffered by Jesus on the cross as he took on the sins of the world, past, present, and future, becoming sin himself so that we might be justified before holy God on the last day. We face lots of trials in our own lives, deaths of friends and family, uh, the loss of a child or the loss of a job, economic hardship, poverty, addiction, disease, injuries, bad weather that damages our homes, damages our vehicles or our crops, or leaves us, like I was last weekend, shivering, wet and cold, and an event that I should have been enjoying. And during those times, it can be really tempting to blame God or to ask why. And that's okay. It's, it's human nature to ask why. Why, oh why? Woe is me. Is that a sin? Yeah, that's a sin. But don't worry, because Jesus died for that sin too. Remember, Jesus never promised us our best lives now, as some well-coiffed prosperity preachers might tell you. With their big shiny teeth and their big giant mega churches. He never promised us peace. He never promised us health or wealth or abundance. He promised that all who have faith in him might have eternal life. He promised that though we may suffer in this world, we who put our faith in his promises will live eternally in the next. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Happy Easter, everybody. Um, This week, we've got another 
of our variety shows. We've got segments from my awesome cast. Sergeant Bill has got a, a holster review for you. Uh, Mia is sharing some safety tips when you use ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft. And Pastor Bennett has a new pontification about what else? Easter. But first, let's talk about some really awesome people, you, our listeners, and particularly those of you who support the show through your purchases at the Armed Lutheran Shop or our affiliate partners like Dunkin' Donuts or Gun Mag Warehouse and our beloved patrons who are members of the Reformation Gun Club. Armed Lutheran Radio is listener-funded radio, and that means no commercials, no financial commitments, which might cloud our judgment or, or color our product reviews like the one you'll hear today, but it also means no money. And that's where you come in. By supporting the show in one of the aforementioned ways, you make all of this possible. Check out the show notes for episode 167, where we have links that you can use to support the show when you go shopping, and check out the Reformation Gun Club at armedlutheran.us slash gun club and learn all about the cool benefits and the exclusive content available for members. Thank you again for your support. Now, sit back and enjoy the show. You can help support Armed Lutheran Radio just by listening to the show. Go to armedlutheran.us slash radio and download the Radio Public app and start listening. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. I'm Alan Gottlieb, founder of the Second Amendment Foundation. When someone says, we don't need that kind of gun, remind them the Founding Fathers determined what rights our Constitution should protect. There's a world of difference between rights and needs. It is not the function of government to tell us what we need or what we don't. Certainly no one needs an assault rifle or a Saturday Night Special, or for that matter, no one needs a Corvette with a high capacity horsepower engine capable of speeds to 150 miles per hour. But in the hands of honest, responsible individuals, we have the right of choice. We have the right to read books others don't like. We have the right to listen to any radio program we choose. We have the right to dress the way we want to. We also have the right to own firearms of our choice. So the next time someone tells you, you don't need something, tell them. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. Join the Second Amendment Foundation today so that this message and our Bill of Rights might live. Call 425-454-7012. That's 425-454-7012. Time now for Mia's Motivations with Mia Einstein. In this day and age, we have a lot of things that when I was a child were thought that like, you would have been crazy to have. My grandparents and my dad even, he would think we're just insane to have listening devices in our hands, our cell phones, and in our homes, the Alexas and the Google Home and also televisions, even TVs listen so they can present ads to you and that way they can make more money. And who doesn't wanna make more money? We all wanna make more money, right? Of course we do. But something that also is quite amazing is that nowadays we accept rides from strangers, total strangers. We tap on our device and order up a car and we hop in with a total stranger. Taxis, when I was a kid, were pretty scary as it was. And now we've got random people driving up and picking us up. These companies, Uber and Lyft, they do background checks on their drivers and they have records and so forth. But what's going on is people are hopping in cars that they thought was their ride that really weren't. And so Style Me Tactical has eight tips that we really need to pay attention to. I'm going to read them to you and I may interject a thought or two in between, but I definitely think that you and your families should have a look at these as well. I'll put a link in the notes to Style Me Tactical. Eight ride share safety tips on stylemetactical.com. Number one, always verify the car you are getting into by double checking that the license plate, make, and model of the car matches the information on the app. It's impossible to know what every car model looks like, but start with the car's make and color. Then verify the license plate. That is your key. If the license plate number doesn't match what is in the app, don't get in. The driver can 
I'm going to insert a word here. The driver can complain about it and make excuses, but if it doesn't match, don't take a chance. Report the discrepancy with the app's customer service. Don't fret over any potential cancellation fee. You might be charged because your life isn't worth that fee, and most likely the service will reimburse the charge, and that is 100% true. One thing I will know is that on Uber and Lyft, they actually give you a little picture of the car and what it looks like, so you have an idea of what a Toyota Corolla looks like. And then you know what that looks like as the cars are driving up. License plate, take a second. It only takes a second to verify the license plate with what you've got on your app. Do it, your life depends on it. Number two, before you get in, ask the driver who the ride is for. Have the driver tell you your name. If he can't tell or doesn't know, don't get in. You can also ask for the driver to verify his name and you can make sure that it matches what is in the app as well. We're so forthcoming with information nowadays. Don't tell him, hi, I'm Mia, are you here for me? Because of course a stranger is gonna be like, oh yeah, I'm here to pick you up, blah, 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 you know. So use some common sense and Ask them who they're there for, ask them their name, make sure everything matches. It just takes a second, don't be in too much of a hurry. Number three, once you are in your ride, Uber has a feature where you can share your route with another person. This allows the person or persons you sent this to, to track your route. I'm not sure about Lyft as I don't use it, but I'm sure they have a similar feature. So that's a great thing, share where you're going. So if somebody is watching, Somebody that you love or loves you, cares about you, will watch where you're going and hopefully they can be a help if need be. And if you know if Lyft has that feature, will you please let us know? Give us a comment. Number four, choose to sit in the back seat of the car instead of sitting in the front seat. By sitting in the back, you've got a little barrier between you and the driver. This allows you to keep an eye on the driver and where you are going. While it's not much distance between you and the driver, it's better than being right next to them. The back seat gives us some distance where you can potentially have time to draw your self-defense tool should you need to. You can also discreetly text and it also provides two doors to get out from versus the one in the passenger seat. Something to note here, I don't know if you've seen several of these reports about abductions and so forth, is one of them that I read that she was actually in the back seat, but the childproof locks were enabled. Take caution and have plans, um, know how to defend yourself, take some classes. Number five, it's perfectly normal to talk with your driver, but be cautious of the information you give out. I've had a mix of drivers, some super talkative and others we don't really speak except for the informalities of verification and a quick exchange of pleasure teas. But for those that love to talk and are ones that really are inquisitive, be mindful of the information you're telling. I'll have drivers that, while the conversation is harmless and are just making conversation, they will ask and make comments such as, this is a nice neighborhood, is this where you live? And my answer always is, no, I had an errand in the neighborhood. It just kind of creeps me out when they start getting a little too nosy. That tip there is a great one for every day of your life, whether you're at the gas pump, whether you're in line at the grocery store. Don't give too much personal information to strangers. Number six, within the app itself, keep your profile information minimal. Uber doesn't share your actual phone number with the driver. The driver has access to contact you, but it is through the app where the number is made anonymous. For your name, instead of providing your full name and last name, just include your first name and the first initial of your last name. Personally, I don't include a photo in my app either. I don't think it is necessary. And that's another thing where you, if you adhere to rule number two and you ask who are you here for, they don't need your picture. So it's okay. Number seven, when it comes time to order your ride sharing service, wait inside to request your ride. Don't wait on the corner of the street with your head down in your phone. If you can request your ride inside and wait inside until your car arrives. Be mindful of the time of day and the area you are requesting your ride. That's another one. If there is a doorman, if you're at a hotel or something like that, ask them to keep an eye out, ask them for help because they definitely will be helpful. And another thing with your head down in your phone, you have no situational awareness. So get your nose out of your phone. I mean, maybe have the app open so you can glance and double check that license plate, but that's about it. You don't need to be texting or doing your social media at that time. Number eight. 
If you're in an unfamiliar city and staying at a hotel, check with a concierge to see if the if they recommend any ride share services. Some cities don't have ride sharing, so it's good to double check and see what is available. Additionally, you can always map out your destination using the map app on your phone so that you have an idea where you need to go before requesting your ride. This rider does have a bonus tip, and the bonus tip says, I feel this should go without saying, but always buckle up. Those are the tips and I hope that this will help you a little. Keep that in mind and on that note, have a great one. See you next time, bye guys. You can read more from Mia, watch her YouTube videos, or check out her podcast, Mac Outdoors with Mia and Leah at miaanstein.com. Honest citizens like you protect themselves every day. We talk about it every week on the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Were these gun owners lucky, or did they have a plan? How should we defend the people we love? We discuss recent examples on the Self-Defense Gun Stories podcast. Put us in your pocket. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill and this is your Ballistic Minute. Today I'm going to do a review of a holster for a concealed carry that I just got recently. So I've been seeing ads on Facebook and online and even YouTube everywhere for this Brave Response holster from Brave Response Shooting. Now like most concealment holsters, they claim that it's one size fits all and it's fantastic and it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and you can carry all day and it's comfortable, etc., etc., etc. So I couldn't resist. I had to order one. So I ordered one and I got it in the mail and I tried it out for a couple days and here's what I came up with my Brave Response holster. So they actually have a couple different ones. They have the Brave Response holster original and then they have the appendix holster. I got the appendix holster, and after wearing it for a couple days, here's my pros. The pros for this is that it's made in America, which is outstanding. It says that almost any gun will fit it, which into the holster type pouch, pretty much any gun that I have will fit some better than others. It carries a spare magazine or two, which is actually kind of nice because most holsters don't come with a magazine carrier, which most holsters shouldn't have a magazine carrier. But appendix-style holsters, that's kind of, you know, 50-50 as to whether you're going to get it. And it's always good to have a spare magazine on hand in case you have a malfunction or something happens. Or if you need more ammo. It came with free shipping, which is nice. And it also has a 60-day money-back guarantee. They say that if from date of purchase you don't like it, send it back. To them in like new condition and they'll issue a refund they also will do two-year warranty on workmanship if something isn't right beyond normal wear and tear they'll either repair it or replace it okay let's get on to the cons list it's a nylon holster it's basically a nylon holster that's almost a fanny pack if you had a nylon fanny pack style holster and you cut off the front of it that's pretty much what this is. I tried putting several full-size guns into it, and the holster did not really cover the trigger guard. Not completely, which is not a good thing and is very dangerous. Okay, and it also has no passive retention. Passive retention would be like that click on a Kydex holster that locks it into place. It's passive because you don't have to press any buttons or do anything, undo a snap or anything to get the gun out of the holster. It does have an active retention strap, but sadly, mine was shipped without one, which isn't a big loss because I wouldn't use an active retention strap unless it was like a thumb strap, but most people don't have any experience using a thumb strap type holster like a police holster because they're not that useful in a concealed carry setting. And like every other nylon holster I've ever had or tried or used or seen used, you cannot reholster one-handed. You can reholster while holding the the pouch open with your non-dominant hand. When you go to holster, you're going to muzzle your other hand 
which is a safety violation and not good. And to make it even worse, it's not really easy to put on. So you're basically putting on like a fanny pack type holster that is going to go under your pants. So you basically have to put it on before you put your pants on or, you know, before you zip up and button and put it over the top of it. And the straps are behind you where the Velcro is. And it's just, it's not very easy to do. And last but not least, it makes the gun have a little bit of a forward cant to it. Now, an appendix holster, you don't really want any forward cant to the gun. In a hip holster or behind the hip, you do. And after weighing all the pros and cons, if you haven't figured it out by now, yes, I'm going to check out their 60-day money-back guarantee because I don't like it. I don't find it conceals well. The butt of the gun and even the back of the slide stick out. And it's not easy to use. It's not actually a safe holster. So I'm going to be sending it back. Hopefully I get my money back. Maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'll try a holster that is, is as quiet as the footsteps of a Navy SEAL? Yeah, probably not. So if you're like me and you keep seeing ads for the Brave Response Holster, you can either take my advice and hide them on Facebook or delete those emails or block them or whatever you need to do. Or go ahead, get one. Try it out. See if their 60-day money-back guarantee works for you because you'll probably be sending it back. I'm Sergeant Bill. This has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Force and a master class competitive shooter. You can check out his YouTube videos at armedlutheran.us slash Sergeant Bill. I want to take a minute here to thank our partner, the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. If you're involved in a situation where you have to use your firearm in self-defense, you very well may find yourself in a legal battle against overzealous prosecutors or the families of the criminal who you shot or threatened, who are looking to deprive you of your freedom or your hard-earned savings. You may find yourself charged with a crime or facing a civil lawsuit even if you did nothing wrong. That's where Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network comes in. For a small yearly fee, they will provide you with money for attorneys, money for bail, consultations, and access to experts like Marty Hayes and Masad Ayub. Don't face the fight alone. Visit Armed Citizens Network today. Use the promo code ARMEDLUTHERAN-25. Save $25 off your first year's membership, or you can grab the coupon on my website, armedlutheran.us. Sign up today. They will send you lots of cool resources, eight instructional DVDs, and a book by Masad Ayub that I cannot recommend highly enough. Don't wait until you need their help. Be prepared. Sign up today. Visit armedcitizensnetwork.org. It's time for Pastoral Pontifications with Pastor John Bennett. Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Today, Christians around the world are celebrating the resurrection of Christ and remembering our Lord's victory over death and the grave. But at the same time, today is also a day that often incites hatred and mockery from those who consider themselves enemies of Christ and his church. At no time in our nation's history has it been more acceptable to mock and ridicule Christians. Now, while this is truly sad, Sadder yet are those who tell lies that supposedly refute the resurrection. Some, most often militant atheists, will go so far as to claim that Jesus never even existed, that there was no historical person named Jesus who lived in Israel in the first century. So the question for today is there any legitimacy to these claims? Is there any evidence whatsoever that Jesus never actually existed, or, if he did exist, that he never rose from the dead? There are many arguments that refute these attacks on the Christian faith. 
If the resurrection was indeed a hoax, it would have had to be the greatest conspiracy in the history of the world. Think for a moment. What would have been required for this to have been a hoax? You have Jesus' twelve disciples who were martyred for their confession that Jesus is the crucified and risen Son of God. Just to clarify, when I say the twelve, I am excluding Judas, who killed himself after our Lord was arrested and put on trial, as well as the apostle John, who died of old age. Within the twelve, I include Matthias, who replaced Judas. Matthias, who, according to the book of Acts, had been with Christ throughout his earthly ministry. I'm also including the Apostle Paul, who, even though he did not become Apostle until after our Lord's ascension, was also martyred for the Christian faith. And not only these Apostles of our Lord, but many others gave their lives, often in excruciating ways, for their confession that this Jesus is the Son of God who was crucified and is risen again to give the gift of everlasting life to all who trust in Him. If all of this were a fabrication, that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, had somehow made this all up in order that they might have some sort of personal gain, you would have thought that at least at some point someone would have broken rank. Think about it for a minute. In order for this to have been a hoax, it would have required every single one of those martyrs who gave their life for Christ to have known that they were doing this for a lie. At some point, someone would have had to have broken ranks. Someone would have had to say, the heck with this. I'm not giving my life for something I know to be a lie. Now, this is just one of the simplest logical arguments that easily refutes these claims that the resurrection was a hoax. One of the other common objections to the resurrection of Christ is the claim that because we only have materials recorded by those who are followers of Jesus, that they had an ulterior motive in recording the history of Christ's death and resurrection as they did. But the problem with this objection is that in addition to the biblical record, there are numerous extra-biblical historical accounts that make mention of Christ and the resurrection. Now, some of these historical accounts are actually hostile to the Christian faith, specifically the Roman historians Pliny and Tacitus, who both make mention of Jesus in their writings, but also mocked Christians for believing in the resurrection. I wonder if they ever took the time to think if these Christians weren't possibly on to something since they were willing to give their life for their confession. We also have the first century Jewish historian Josephus, who documented the spread of the Christian faith. Now, I mentioned earlier the Apostle Paul. What's interesting about the Apostle Paul is that his martyrdom is well documented by Roman historians. And the reason for this is because Paul was a prominent Roman citizen in his day, and he was put to death by the Roman government for his confession of faith. And of course, there's that curious little detail that Paul himself was formerly known as Saul, someone who persecuted the Christian faith, but yet he himself willingly gave his life for his confession. Now granted, much of the evidence of the resurrection is circumstantial, such as the witness of church history and tradition, and the fact that in the last nearly 2,000 years, no one has been able to produce the bones of Jesus. 
But aside from that, ultimately, it does all come down to faith. It does come down to believing on the basis of our faith in the scriptural account of our Lord's resurrection. It all comes down to trusting in the witness of the blood of the martyrs, those who had borne witness to the crucifixion, and those who later would see our resurrected Lord and would place their fingers into the marks of the nails and the spear. And then after seeing our resurrected Lord, would give their life for their testimony, their witness, that this Jesus is the Son of God, and that through faith in Him, one has the hope of everlasting life. In closing, I read to you part of the appointed epistle reading for this celebration of the resurrection of our Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. May the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord fill your hearts with joy, hope, and peace. Amen. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback, or a review on iTunes, and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.